Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Dan Dulick. I am a pediatric infectious disease physician at Vanderbilt University Medical Center in Nashville, Tennessee. I'm very uh, excited and thankful to be able to talk to you today at the Immune Deficiency Foundation National Meeting. Uh, my topic for today is uh, antimicrobial prophylaxis in primary immune deficiency disorders, a uh, comprehensive approach. Um, so uh, let's get started. Now, this is a, a big topic, and there's no way I'll cover all of it in the 20 to 30 minutes that we have allotted to us. Uh, but uh, I am going to outline uh, my framework and my um, uh, big picture overview for how I approach these kinds of questions. Uh, so antimicrobial prophylaxis in primary immune deficiency disorders is uh, very common. Uh, this uh, figure on the right shows a, a survey response uh, from um, uh, from a cohort of um, immunologists in the U.S. Uh, and it shows the uh, percent of respondents using antimicrobial prophylaxis for certain disorders. And you can see that ranging from acamaglobulinemia to XLP, uh, antimicrobial prophylaxis is used in anywhere between 50 to uh, 90 or almost 100 percent of uh, patients or practices. Uh, however, uh, despite this common use, uh, evidence is limited, and that's not to say that antimicrobial prophylaxis doesn't uh, work. It's more just to say that uh, specific studies in the patients with immune deficiencies um, are, um, are not uh, commonly done. And so evidence uh, is frequently abstracted from other clinical scenarios. Um, and importantly, there are uh, regional and sort of worldwide discrepancies in uh, use. So the approach to prophylaxis in the U.S. is different a little bit from that in Europe um, and uh, so on. Uh, importantly, also, um, antimicrobial prophylaxis and in general, the diagnosis and management of immune deficiency diseases is uh, becoming increasingly complicated because there is an increasing number of immune deficiency disorders um, and immune dysregulatory disorders diagnosed. Uh, so this is data that you are all well uh, familiar with uh, from the International Union of Immunologic Societies, uh, showing that the number of genetic defects uh, described and reported has markedly increased over the last, um, well, five to 10 years even, but um, even longer, um, there has been an increase in the numbers. So, um, so many more uh, different kinds of diagnoses being made, uh, many more new diagnoses being made for which evidence is uh, uh, incomplete. And so uh, there is, as always, much to learn. Uh, so the um, sort of big picture for prophylaxis, uh, the benefits, um, the potential benefits of prophylaxis, I think, are very logical and concrete. Um, it's easy to uh, picture that patients with prophylaxis uh, have fewer infections, hospitalizations, and clinic visits, although these things are a little hard to quantify in randomized trials. Uh, the potential risks of prophylaxis are remote and hard to monitor, so uh, clearly not all of your patients get antimicrobial resistance. Um, and even more challenging, uh, uh, understanding what the impact of the altered microbiome from antimicrobial exposure um, is, is difficult. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit more about uh, the lack of evidence there later on um, and cover that uh, in later slides. So the objectives for this talk, um, I'll review a comprehensive approach to antimicrobial prophylaxis in patients with primary immune deficiency. And we'll review a couple uh, recent studies uh, for prophylaxis approaches in patients with primary immune deficiency. So I've uh, tried to distill down my uh, big picture approach to thinking about prophylaxis in patients with immune deficiency and immune dysregulation. And we'll review that a little bit here, and then we'll go into an illustrative case uh, later on. So we start, as always, with the category of immune deficiency. So what are the defined genetics that a, a genetic diagnosis or diagnosis that a specific patient has? And if they don't, what's the sort of uh, syndromic category of immune deficiency that they have? Is it T-cell, B-cell, neutrophil, complement, et cetera? Uh, then <clears throat> we always review uh, comorbidities. So is there bronchiectasis present? Are there any allergies or intolerances? Um, and is there any end organ dysfunction that might impair or alter how um, prophylactic medicines are metabolized? Um, as always, you review the specific infection history for a patient. Uh, 
uh, what have they had previously, uh, what have they had recently, uh, what are the, di the infections that they battle with most frequently. Um, and then uh, increasingly we have to, well, as always, but increasingly we um, have to figure out, is there any immune dysregulation going on um, that might um, say, for example, impair their mucosal barrier uh, function. So is there colitis that might make them more likely to translocate bacteria into the bloodstream? And then from that, um, is there any iatrogenic immune suppression that's being administered to control that immune dysregulation? And how might that impact the prophylaxis strategy? And from that, you get a sense of the infection risks of a specific patient. Uh, what are the specific infections they are likely to deal with? What are the ones they have dealt with? And what's the prophylaxis strategy uh, that you want to move forward with or you think is uh, necessary? Now, I do add a few things that I call kind of modifiers to that. So uh, that can kind of that can impact the prophylaxis regimen that you choose for your patients. Uh, and those are uh, three shown here, and we'll go into those in greater detail in later slides. So is there a definitive treatment option or options for your patient with immune deficiency? Uh, is there a gen genotype phenotype correlation? Uh, so if that's present, how does that modify the kinds of infections your patients at risk for? And then what are the ad potential adverse effects for um, the antimicrobials that you're choosing? So to discuss this uh, more in more detail and to give an example, we'll go through an illustrative case. Uh, so this is a 13 year old boy uh, with NEMO deficiency who presents to your immunology clinic to establish care. He presented with spontaneous Staph aureus bacteremia at six months of age that was successfully treated and he was subsequently referred to immunology for evaluation. Uh, in the course of that evaluation, he aged and he became 10 months of age and his uh, teeth started to erupt um, and his pediatrician noted conical teeth. Um, therefore, targeted uh, capsid kinase uh, gamma sequencing was sent and uh, that showed a pathogenic mutation, uh, missense mutation in the zinc finger domain. So as a young child, his infection history was generally mild. Um, he did well with occasional respiratory viral infections and no invasive infections apart from his Staph aureus bacteremia. Uh, previously, he was on subcutaneous immune globulin replacement and prophylactic antibiotics. For our purposes, we won't really go into what he had before. Um, he was having breakthrough infections, um, and then the family had to move and had to reestablish care with immunology. There were some gaps in care, a little bit of loss to follow up. Um, and they, uh, in the course of that, stopped his prophylaxis six months ago. So he subsequently had three pneumonia episodes, one of which had strep uh, pneumobacteremia that was azithromycin resistant. One, uh, one time or shortly afterwards, he had a chest CT showing some developing right lower lobe bronchiectasis. And he had a staph aureus soft tissue abscess as well in his right thigh uh, that was methicillin resistant and also of note, Bactrim resistant. So. He's had occasional HSV oral outbreaks, none of which have been terribly severe. Uh, these have been about one to two times per year. And family is coming to you both to establish care and to revisit all the prophylaxis options. They want to know what the evidence is and they want to know what the best course is uh, for their child. So uh, Nemo deficiency, I'm sure you all uh, know well, um, is nf kappa essential modifier deficiency. Um, there, uh, ever since the uh, two, early 2000s, a link between ectodermal dysplasia with immune deficiency and mutations in the um, ICAFA B uh, kinase gamma subunit have been well defined. Um, and in the years since then, uh, um, NEMO deficiency has been associated with a wide variety of immunologic and infectious phenotypes. So, hyper IgM, NK deficiencies, specific antibody deficiencies, and Mendelian susceptibility to mycobacterial disease. Now, um, I bring this up, I use NEMO in this, in this setting, not so much as a, uh, that this is a novel or a new diagnosis or even a new mutation, but more that it's just a really good model for reviewing all the considerations that go into antibiotic prophylaxis. Um, you guys talked about a lot of the pieces of the puzzle with NEMO, um, and there are a lot of infections uh, that these patients are predisposed to, so it gives us a chance to talk about a lot of, a lot of angles on this. So getting back to our <clears throat> over, big picture overview approach. Uh, so uh, with this patient, his immunodeficiency category is clearly a combined immune deficiency uh, with susceptibility to mycobacterial disease. He um, has some comorbidities. He has some early bronchiectasis. 
uh, though he doesn't have any defined allergies or intolerances. Uh, thankfully, he does not have uh, any evidence of colitis or GI uh, disorder uh, with his Nemo. He does have a history of Staph aureus, as, you, as we talked about a second ago, as well as recurrent pneumonia. And uh, he does not appear to have any immune dysregulation uh, at this point. So um, based on his history, uh, preliminary prophylaxis regimen might look like this. So he's predisposed to these organisms and has the bronchiectasis complication. So you could come up with a regimen based on those findings and his resistance patterns uh, here with Bactrim, Quinda, Mox, Azithromycin, Acyclovir. Um, so is this our prophylaxis regimen? Uh, maybe, but hopefully not. It's a lot of antibiotics. There'll be a high pill burden there. Um, and could be challenging to administer. Um, clearly, if he needs all these things, then he should receive them. Uh, but I think there's a little modification that we can do. Uh, so then getting into our more targeted approach, <clears throat> looking at each of the pieces of uh, the each of the modifiers that I mentioned before, genotype, phenotype, correlation, uh, definitive treatment options, uh, any evidence from clinical trials or uh, clinical studies, and then what are potential adverse effects that he might encounter. Um, and then we'll come back to our prophylaxis regimen. So for Nemo, uh, thankfully, that's one of the reasons I chose it for this case, there is some degree of genotype phenotype correlation uh, that's defined with Nemo uh, deficiency. So uh, two examples of that um, are here with mycobacterial susceptibility on top and then CD40 signaling slash hyper IgM phenotype on the bottom. Uh, this information comes from a paper from Jordan Orange's group uh, from a while ago now, about 13 years ago, but I think it's still informative for uh, thinking about prophylaxis in these patients. Clearly, uh, genotype infectious phenotype correlation isn't always present and likely isn't present in many immune deficiencies, but when it is, it can be very useful. Uh, so as you can see in this graph, or in this figure uh, with the um, NEMO gene uh, laid out in front of us, um, you have a variety of uh, reported uh, mutations uh, shown here. And then you can see that some, but not all of these mutations are associated with a strong mycobacterial susceptibility. So um, the hatch lines show uh, mutations, circle areas with mutations where there has not been reported mycobacterial susceptibility. And the purple colored in areas uh, show um, uh, mutations where there has been mycobacterial susceptibility reported. In the bottom, similarly, uh, you can see with sort of the hyper IgM phenotype <coughs> and the um, and impaired CD40 signaling, um, you can see mutations that uh, are associated with those and then some that are not associated with those. Uh, so in this paper, uh, you uh, the um, a very useful uh, uh, table was created from this data showing uh, the mutations on the top line here and then on the vertical axis uh, in the rows, uh, the different uh, phenotypes ranging from ectodermal dysplasia uh, to the different kinds of immunophenotypes that could be present. So for our purposes with this uh, specific patient, you can see that uh, clearly ectodermal dysplasia is associated with this mutation. The viral infections don't seem to be very common. Uh, hypogam is, is uh, frequently reported, and then the hyper IgM phenotype is also reported as well. Um, however, uh, mycobacterial infection frequency is a little bit lower uh, than you might see with other mutations. Now, this is useful, uh, should be taken with a grain of salt, because uh, you can see here that the numbers of patients uh, contributing to each of these categories are a little bit low, and so only one of the three patients had mycobacterial infection, but still, um, that could be um, a function of the low numbers of patients reported. Still, there is some uh, utility in thinking about this in terms of pro uh, what prophylaxis they use. Um, and in certain um, other immune deficiencies, it may be uh, more or uh, less useful to think about the genotype phenotype correlation. Um, another um, way of thinking about this is something that I've uh, somewhat jokingly called the phenotype phenotype correlation. So, is there a correlation between the immunophenotype and the infectious phenotype? <clears throat> so what, um, what does the data uh, from your specific patient tell you about their immune function and how that might play into their infectious phenotype? So for Nemo, there is some evidence that um, uh, uh, lab studies showing T-cell impairment uh, predict a severe clinical course 
this isn't a small cohort, and this group showed that uh, a skewing of T cells towards naivete, so lack of memory T cell differentiation, was associated with significant uh, infections. Um, and in these uh, more severe patients, they also showed impaired T cell mitogen proliferation. And so there is some um, honing of infection risk that can be done using uh, functional assays. Um, although, um, again, this has to be taken within the context of the bigger picture. The next uh, modifier that I'd like to talk about is, is what definitive treatment options are there uh, for your patients? So um, is there a definitive therapy that can be used for the disorder that your patient has? Um, could, is uh, stem cell transplant an option? Is gene therapy an option? And, and, and by extension, if there um, is uh, therapy or if there is not, how long will the prophylaxis be administered? Uh, so you can envision that if your patient is uh, moving towards stem cell transplant, is just getting over a severe infection, you're going to go all in on prophylaxis to try and to successfully get them to transplant uh, without a severe infection or without any sort of delay. And so um, you may tolerate a more aggressive prophylaxis regimen in that setting with more um, poly pharmacy there uh, than you might in another setting because you're really just trying to get things, get the patient through transplant. Versus if you have a patient for whom uh, transplant isn't a great option um, or isn't a viable option, uh, prophylaxis may be a longer term play. And so you may not want to do um, <clears throat> as aggressive of a regimen. You may be stuck uh, with um, uh, limiting the number of uh, antimicrobials that you can use uh, for tolerance purposes. And so just by way of example, uh, there's data on uh, for NEMO uh, in um, an international cohort of almost 30 patients with NEMO deficiency, uh, showing that stem cell transplantation is um, uh, associated with about a 75% survival. Um, so the question really is sort of, you know, for your specific patient and your specific scenario, is there a therapy that um, um, you'd be aiming for uh, to get the patient to. Um, with NEMO, this isn't, um, uh, stem cell transplantation, as you know, isn't always used, um, and it doesn't cure uh, colitis if that's present. Uh, so there are a lot of challenges in thinking about that with NEMO. Um, and then we come to what evidence is out there. So there are any uh, clinical trials or cohort studies that can shed light on um, uh, prophylaxis strategies for primary immune deficiency patients. And we'll uh, step a little bit away from our illustrative case here to, uh, to talk about uh, what evidence is out there. So for antibody deficiency and chronic lung disease, uh, chronic lung injury is a common complication of antibody deficiency disorders despite um, immunoglobulin replacement. Um, bronchiectasis occurs uh, fairly frequently in antibody deficiency patients, ranging from 23 to 50% in different studies. Um, and interventions including antibiotic prophylaxis could decrease infection frequency and could, de <coughs> excuse me, and could decrease pulmonary exacerbations. Uh, so azithromycin prophylaxis is used in the setting of COPD, of cystic fibrosis, of non-cystic fibrosis bronchiectasis, and has shown some benefit in reducing respiratory exacerbations. But until recently, there wasn't much evidence on this in primary immune deficiency disorders. However, two recent studies have shown, um, have looked at <coughs> antibiotic prophylaxis in the context of antibody deficiency. And we'll review those now uh, to keep us all up to date on the literature. So azithromycin prophylaxis in patients with, with primary antibody deficiencies was studied in a randomized controlled trial uh, looking at azithromycin versus uh, placebo um, in antibody deficiency patients with uh, infection-related pulmonary diseases, as you can see here. So this was a double-blind randomized controlled trial with enrollment over three years. It was published in the Journal of Allergy and Clinical Immunology in 2019. And patients were followed pretty closely, or very closely, uh, with baseline samples and studies, as well as monthly check-ins, quarterly pulmonary function tests, and then an end-of-study analysis as well. And what this cohort showed uh, was that there was a decrease in the exacerbation incidence rate for uh, patients who received azithromycin uh, compared to those who received placebo. And you can see that in the uh, per-patient year numbers here. Um, as well as in the hazard ratio. So the hazard ratio for respiratory exacerbation was uh, 0.5 in the, um, in the azithromycin group compared to the placebo group. 
And the number needed to treat, uh, number needed to prevent one respiratory exacerbation was uh, seven um, in the azithromycin group. And you can see the Kappa Meyer curve here, uh, showing that over time there was a decrease in the frequency of exacerbations with the azithromycin use. Interestingly, there was no apparent uh, impact on antimicrobial resistance in this. So azithromycin groups and placebo groups had similar frequency of uh, susceptible and non-susceptible isolates. Uh, there was no um, impact on um, predict, percent predicted FEV1 over time. So that calls into question whether or not azithromycin prophylaxis would impact long-term pulmonary outcomes, um, even though the study showed that it did impact uh, short-term um, respiratory exacerbations. And I will point out uh, one cohort study um, from uh, Dr. Cunningham Rundles that showed that over a long period of time, it did not seem like bronchiectasis was an independent predictor of mortality in CVID. And uh, so maybe um, uh, this just calls into question some of the, the endpoints with the study and what the long-term benefit of zithromycin might be. A <clears throat> uh, second study that doesn't play into our case as much, uh, but is relevant given that it is a uh, 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 robustly performed study that was recently published in the Journal of Clinical Immunology. So in this study, uh, the authors performed a randomized crossover trial uh, comparing uh, Bactrim prophylaxis with IVID in patients with either Ig subclass deficiency or uh, specific antibody deficiency. It was primarily in adults and they showed that was uh, no efficacy difference uh, for infection prevention between IVIG and Bactrim in this cohort. Uh, I bring this up more just to keep us all up to date on the literature. Um, it's um, a little hard to uh, extend this uh, paper to, um, uh, to clinical practice, I think, but, um, but it does uh, show some potential benefit for Bactrim prophylaxis in this, uh, in this patient group. So then getting to our next modifier, what are the adverse effects that a certain uh, regimen might have? So what's the impact on the microbiome? Uh, what are potential drug reactions? And what is the impact on antimicrobial resistance? So clearly for our, our patient, azithromycin prolongs the QT interval. Um, there's a risk for that, especially when using other QT prolonging medications. So for your adult med uh, patients who might be on uh, cardiac, cardiac medicines, um, and then for our patients who have other infections and are on uh, fluoroquinolones, uh, you can get uh, pretty impressive, or on azoles, you can get pretty impressive QT prolonging with uh, polypharmacy in this context. And then importantly, determining whether or not non-tuberculous mycobacteria are present prior to starting azithromycin prophylaxis is hugely important, um, especially in patients with bronchiectasis. Um, you, do not want to monotherapy or treat a, a patient with a non-tuberculous mycobacteria infection with monotherapy azithromycin. It creates a whole world of challenges for treatment and um, just not something that needs to happen. Um, importantly, um, even though that prior study that I mentioned does um, showed uh, that there wasn't much resistance uh, difference between uh, antimicrobial resistance difference between placebo and azithromycin treated patients, um, in another study from a while ago, um, in otherwise healthy patients, um, you can see very rapid resistance induction to macrolides like azithromycin or clarithromycin with a short period of treatment. So this was a study of healthy volunteers who were randomized to placebo or azithromycin or clarithromycin uh, treatment for a very short period of time. So the treatment period was only uh, for about seven days. And then Following that, um, they did, or, or before and after that, they did oropharyngeal swabs to look for macrolide resistance and oropharyngeal streptococci. And you can see that shortly after treatment, that resistance rate increases significantly. <clears throat> and it, impressively, they follow these patients over a long period of time for six months. And you can see that the frequency decreases over time in the absence of macrolide treatment, uh, given, again, that treatment was only for this first week and the increase appeared to persist as long as six weeks, um, it is something to be concerned with. Whoops, excuse me. And then finally, thinking about um, what's the impact of prophylaxis on the microbiota? And is there any impact on immune function or dysregulation in immune deficiency or immune dysregulatory patients? 
um, from their prophylaxis. Um, I bring these questions up just to show you that um, we don't know. We really don't know. There's very little um, to no data on this in immune deficiency disorder patients. And so it's not clear what impact the prophylaxis regimen choice has on the microbiota and by extension, what that impact is from a change in microbiota on um, any immune deficiency phenotypes. Uh, to kind of illustrate the potential for um, um, uh, impact of this, of uh, microbiota alterations on <clears throat> immune deficiency phenotypes, um, I'll show two a uh, little bit of data from two papers. Um, so these are in the context, these are two studies that were done a few years ago in uh, stem cell transplant recipients, so not, not necessarily primary immune deficiency, just overall stem cell deficiency. Um, and they show that um, uh, broad spectrum antibiotic use, especially um, antibiotics that include um, anaerobic coverage, are independent risk factors for poor outcomes after allogeneic stem cell transplantation. So data from these studies uh, showed here you see um, probability of transplant related mortality on the Y axis and uh, time post-transplant on the um, x-axis. And you can see that um, in these three groups, you have um, patients who receive systemic antibiotics before day zero, patients who received systemic antibiotics on or after day zero, and patients who um, <coughs> received, excuse me, patients who received no systemic antibiotics, patients who received uh, antibiotics before day zero, and patients who received uh, antibiotics on or after day zero. And so you can see that in the two groups of patients who received systemic antibiotics either prior to or shortly after transplant, there was significantly increased transplant related mortality. Looking specifically at GVHD um, and GVHD related mortality, um, this group looked at uh, the use of um, very uh, broad spectrum antibiotics, uh, so a carbapenem, uh, which impacts anaerobic which targets many things, including anaerobes, as well as zosin, which uh, provides anaerobic coverage. And you can see that uh, GVHD-related mortality was significantly increased in the group of patients who received these antibiotics compared to those who didn't. Now, this is not necessarily applicable to immune deficiency patients, um, but it does highlight uh, one example of how um, broad-spectrum antibiotic use can impact uh, patient care outcomes. And so I think um, is also il illustrative of how more studies are needed to understand an antimicrobial impact on immunologic phenotypes in immune deficiency patients. So getting back to our illustrative case, um, you know, from his genotype phenotype correlation, um, there's clearly a risk, for, and from his history, there's clearly a risk of pyogenic infections, maybe, but maybe not a non-tuberculous mycobacterial infection, and then also intact uh, T cell and NK cell function. Um, that we're not pursuing a stem cell transplant for him um, for a variety of reasons. There is some evidence for azithromycin um, uh, benefit in the context of bronchiectasis as we reviewed, um, and we will avoid anaerobic coverage. So uh, we'll not use clindamycin for staph aureus, both to um, <coughs> limit his uh, C. diff risk, but also limit the impact on uh, anaerobic organisms in his GI tract. And so for him, his regimen is Bactro three times a week, um, amoxicillin daily, and azithromycin three times a week. So to conclude, uh, prophylaxis is frequently used and needed to optimize the care of patients with primary immune deficiency and immune dysregulation. Um, evidence is limited, but uh, can be extrapolated from other settings. Clearly, many factors impact the choice of prophylaxis, and it's hard to review all of them in 20 to 30 minutes. Um, a one size does not fit all. We all know that in this context of immune de deficiency. Um, and there's really little knowledge of how antimicrobial and microbiota interactions might impact clinical course for immune deficiency patients. And as always, uh, more studies are needed. So I really appreciate your uh, time in, uh, in coming to the uh, conference today and then listening to my talk. Um, I am here for questions. Um, uh, in person in just a second uh, via Zoom. Uh, thank you all and have a good afternoon.